Yes. There are a lot of people filling in, but we will start in one minute. Hey, tell me. There's still some seats up front if you guys want to come up front. <laughs> so um, why don't we go ahead and get started. So today we're going to talk about the cloud. We're going to talk about how clouds are built. It's going to be a lot of a tutorial. Um, we'll dive deep into some things. And we'll talk about how to secure the cloud, which is very important as well. So, um, and before I start, I'm, my name is Lisa Guess. I'm with Juniper Networks. And I'm vice president for the systems engineering team there. But I also want to let all of you know, since um, we have a large group of IT folks, I started my career back in the late 80s at Shell Oil Company. And I was in their IT department then. So a lot of the challenges that you may have now, you know, I've not always been on the vendor side. I spent about 10 years on the customer side. So I am well aware of the challenges and decisions and, and the different, um, trade-offs you have to make every day as an IT professional. So I just wanted to give that brief intro. So before we jump into the cloud and talk about that, I, I think about cloud. We hear cloud everywhere. Um, just the other day I was at my mom's and she goes, what is the cloud? And I thought, why is my 83-year-old mother worrying about what a, the cloud is? You know, And that's how ubiquitous it's become. And I was thinking, where did that term really come from? So I'm also a trivia buff, and I'm going to give you a few tidbits so you can entertain and amuse your colleagues at your next cocktail party. So um, it's, it's somewhat of a nebulous origin, but the first known reference to a cloud related to networking in an official capacity was in 1977 when there was an ARPANET diagram, and instead of showing the actual network elements, it actually was a cloud. So that was the first known use of it. They did not use the word yet, but it was a symbol. Then in 1994, Wired Magazine used um, the term cloud in a reference to um, general, general computing that was available at the time. So that's really the first known reference in an official document to cloud. And then it wasn't until 2006, Amazon actually um, launched their enabled and elastic computing cloud. And so this is all a fairly relative term, relatively new term, and it's amazing to me how quickly things have evolved over time and how important and ubiquitous the cloud is now, even in our own personal IT shops. So try, um, try to remember that and use it next time, and people will really enjoy it, I'm sure, just like you guys did. <laughs> so the promise of the cloud is, is a, an important one. It's on-demand computing, it's pay-as-you-go, it's elastic computing, you know, it's it's rainbows and unicorns. It's everything you could want. But when you really get to what the cloud is, often it's like this. You know, it's a pile of spaghetti, it's hard to manage, it's hard to secure, it's hard to automate. And that's what we're going to talk about today. How do we simplify, secure, and automate a real cloud and, and all the elements that go into it? So what are the business challenges that might even make you want to embrace the cloud? You know, how do you secure it? How do you innovate without disrupting your business? It's really hard to go from what I would term a legacy data center, very monolithic, into a virtualized data center that you may be on your own premises, and then even harder to leverage public, cl public clouds and to hybridize it. So... Um, if you look at where IT is now, it must be pretty important because 57% of respondents, and this is actually slightly dated, this is from 2014, over half of all the respondents from a fairly major survey had IT shops moving toward the cloud. And you'll see, but you'll also see as many people that want to deploy it, 
You still have more than half of infrastructures don't have any cloud infrastructure whatsoever yet. And that's because there are several challenges that we're going to be talking about. So why, why go to all these challenges and what's driving it? First of all, our applications are changing. Things used to be what we call north-south. So you'd have a very monolithic environment. It might be your finance department and they want to use an ERP system. Or your sales department might have wanted their own isolated CRM system. Now we have social networking. We've got all kinds of uh, applications like PeopleSoft or um, different CRM programs. Now a lot of your traffic is east-west, and this is fundamentally changing your traffic patterns in your data center and driving a lot of the need for the change to cloud. You're needing flatter topologies, and we're going to go into a lot of detail about what that exactly means. We also have some elements of network virtualization available to us that we didn't have before. We've had VLANs for quite a while, probably since uh, early 90s or so, but um, we really haven't gotten to a point where we can start to virtualize our network and run virtualized network functions on bare metal. We're going to talk about that as well as we talk about topologies. And then we get into everything as a service. Um, at Juniper, we're starting to see more and more of our customers either leasing IT as a service from a large provider or maybe even large companies that are um, using a multi-tenant set up where they're providing everything as a service to their different business units. So those are applying in more and more environments. It's not really just you just care about it if you're Amazon or if you're Google. You really care about it even in every everyday IT shops. So today you're here. You know, how do we get where we need to be? And so by, by that I mean here being you've got a customer, an end user, they want a service. So days or weeks later you provision it and then suddenly it comes up and it's running. And that's really not fast enough to satisfy them. In fact, I remember when I started back at Shell all these years ago, um, I was working on their IBM SNA infrastructure. And it took minimum one month to provision a service. And we were using 3270 terminals. I'm probably showing my age to some of you. Some of you probably haven't even heard of this. And you're like, what is she talking about? But, you know, we'd have an end user. And all they would want to do is go from a... Okay, I'm really going to see if anybody knows this. Raise your hand. A 3278 mod 2 to a 3278 mod 5. And that took a month to provision that. And all that was was just changing out a terminal on the end of a coax cable. Did anybody know that term in there? I see a few. Thank you. <laughs> um, so that's where we used to be. What we really, where we really want to be is where that end user clicks, it's provisioned, and they're getting used to that today in their everyday environment. You know, they're, it won't be long until, let's say they have a Comcast service or AT&T service at home. All they have to do is click, and not only do I get it provisioned, I also can add firewall services or content acceleration services on the fly by myself using a portal without even calling anyone. And, and that's where the world is going in a very ubiquitous fashion, even in our own IT shops. What goes into all that? All of these different buzzwords we have down here, SDN, orchestration, you've got all the protocols, you've got automation. So those, those things are important to understand and to factor into where you are. And here's where many, many networks are today. If you think about your data center or even your campus, your resources are in silos. You know, you remember I talked earlier about your finance department needed a specific application and you put that in. And then sales needed a specific thing and you put that in. But everything is siloed and it's not working well together or you have to go multiple hops through the network to get to it. Where you need to be <clears throat> is where you have a physical infrastructure that is at a very high utilization because you're able to virtually overlay networking elements on top of it and utilize all of it. Much like what you're probably already very familiar with doing today on your high-end servers running several virtual machines on them, or maybe you've got fiber channel storage and you've got a storage area network. That's where networking is going as well, where we get to this ubiquitous um, ability to have virtualized networking. Is it easy to get there? No. There's a lot of impediments to it. You've got a complex network. You know, you've got suboptimal topologies. When your traffic was going only in a north-south direction and not east-west, you didn't really care if you had multiple hops it had to go through. When you're going application to application, communicating directly, all of a sudden, 
multiple hops now turn into two times multiple hops, and then you start to have performance issues. So we have problems there. We have manual processes. Everybody's still used to using CLI to go configure their routers, to go configure their switches. You know, we're not, we may have some GUI things on our, on our firewalls, but you're going device by device. That's another impediment. And then let's talk about security. What a challenge that can be then. You've got, um, this complex network and now you're trying to overlay security on top of it and figure out where do I put the firewall? Do I care if I need a firewall between a virtual server and another virtual server on the same physical hardware? What do I do? Or, you know, is it like the old days and all I cared about was just the pipe coming into my data center? Things, things have changed quite a bit in the past few years. Let me use some, a real example to talk about this. So, this is the application silos I've talked about, primarily north-south traffic. Then we evolve over time, and you evolve, you separate out your database, you're starting to get better structured data, so you have a data source, you have an application front end, it's still siloed, and you still aren't able to share the data. But all of a sudden one day, your customers figure out, hey, it'd be really cool if I can just directly access your order management database. or HR figures out, oh, I'm not the only one who needs to see your PeopleSoft application. Maybe every employee could directly interact with my people management application. So all of a sudden, you've got this any-to-any -any traffic, and this is what I was talking about earlier. In today's typical data center and network, greater than 75% of your data is taking this east-west pattern, which is fine because it's got connectivity, but the performance is not going to be what you want it to be. So you sit down one day and you have an IT planning session and you say, okay, here's where we are. Here's where we want to go. So here's our next step is we want to have a virtual data center. So we want to virtualize our data center. Our apps aren't quite resilient yet. You know, they still need five nines reliability out of the data center. So I'm going to design for that. But I'm going to bring in virtual machines. So I'm going to have high-end x86 servers. I'm going to bring in virtual machines. I'm going to put in a SAN and have shared storage, and then I'm going to have layer two switching in my fabric. So that's a much better choice, but you still have challenges with that. And um, you also want to incorporate, let's say, a cloud data center where your apps are more resilient. So think to some of the applications that sit in the cloud today, like um, PeopleSoft is sitting in the cloud. Salesforce.com is much more resilient than it used to be. It's able to sit in the cloud. And if you're, especially if you're leasing cloud services from a larger provider as part of your overall solution, now you're only going to really be able to count on three nines of reliability because now you're going over that IP public network. So you need the, the resiliency, you, but you also get the virtualization. You're able to use um, network attached storage and you have a lot more flexibility. Let's talk about some of the decisions you make with your applications. So let's say you've got a partner app. You know, we talked about your partners might want access to it. And that's maybe not as mission critical to you as maybe your inventory management or your order management. And maybe you might even decide, I'm going to save cycles, and I'm even going to put the partner application into the cloud so that I can free up my own resources and my own management overhead so that I can manage my own mission critical applications. You look at order processing. Now you put that into the data center, and it's much more efficient now. You still own all that infrastructure yourself. And then you think, do I want to put that in the cloud? But no, I don't, because that's where my revenue comes from. And I really can't afford for my order processing to be down. For some of you, it might be customer management, whatever it is that's your core business. And you want to maintain that control of it. Uh, common examples are in our financial industry. They put everything they can into the cloud, but things that are really the crown jewels, they leave in their virtualized data center and, and move as much as they can. Now, maybe you've got this very ancient inventory database that you don't have an ability to move it into the virtualized data center. But you find other applications that you can move in there. Like mail is a great example. In our personal lives, we all use mail in the cloud. We all use CRM in the cloud. That's think of PeopleSoft, think of HR. Um, the Sorry, that's the PeopleSoft. Salesforce.com is in the cloud. So my point is, as you're thinking about this, you're not going to one day wake up and say, everything's going to go into the public cloud. You're going to th have to think carefully through all of your applications and which ones can migrate and which ones are unable to. And the network 
is going to be key to that. And it's going to be more important than ever that your network has what I'm going to define in a minute is called coherency, meaning I don't care where I sit in the network. If it's in my legacy data center, my, my newer upgraded virtualized section of my data center, or in my public cloud, I've got a coherent network. Provisioning has always been a big challenge with, um, with networking, with servers, and with storage. I don't have to tell you that. You know, I told, I illustrated with this, with my story earlier. So in the old days, back when you had to bring up a physical server, it might have taken two months. You had to order it, provision it, find a rack space for it. I remember those days too. This was like in the mid 90s, and we were using NetBIOS and Enterprise LAN Server from IBM. Anybody remember that? <laughs> that one, was, I saw a few. Um, <clears throat> So it took a couple months to really provision that server. So it didn't matter if it took me two weeks to bring up the network or if the storage guys took two weeks to bring it up. But now with the advent and prevalence of the virtual machines in server world, you can actually bring it up in two minutes. In fact, one of our customers, um, very, very large online retailer, they actually bring up servers on the fly in maybe less than five seconds to accommodate for high workloads during the Christmas season. I mean, it's, it's fascinating some of the automation that, that our customers have in play. But what sticks out like a sore thumb now is this two weeks time to provision your network and your storage. So what do we do about that? And that's what we're going to talk about a lot um, later in the presentation. We need to orchestrate it and we need to automate it. But are those two terms equivalent? They're actually not. So, you know, I hear them used interchangeably quite often. Think of automation as, um, I think of wine. So I have grapes, people pluck the grapes and then stomp the grapes. You know, you've got, think of Lucy from that old show. I automate that and all of a sudden now I am crushing grapes in an automated way. It's still a single function. And it's not really related to other functions, but I'm doing it a lot faster. So that's automation. Orchestration, think of that as making wine. So there's different automated things that happen, like I've got my bottler, I've got the thing that puts the cork in, I've got the grape crusher. But think about a true bottle of fine wine. That is what orchestration is. It brings all of those things together. It has intelligence across the processes. You know how long those crushed grapes have sat in your barrel. You know when it's time to bottle, and then you know when it's time to ship it out. And that's really where orchestration comes into play, and that's where the master winemaker comes into play. So that's that's a, a, a way to look at these two things differently, and they're both critically important. So... We've talked a lot about the path to the cloud, and I'm just going to summarize, and we're going to dive into three main elements of how we're going to get to the cloud. So we consolidate. We've got our legacy data center. You start to virtualize servers. A lot of you are probably past that phase, and you're into the optimization phase where you're looking at automating your network, automating your provisioning, automating your storage provisioning. And then where we really want to get to is where you have a self-provision cloud where your end user can go click on a service and your network can provision itself. And that gives you a lot of time to do a lot of your forward planning, do more efficient things with your time rather than sit in front of a CLI and type commands. <clears throat> what does that look like in reality, physically? Because I, I like, I'm an engineer, I like to look at what do these boxes really look like? You know, these are all pretty conceptual things I'm talking about. So if you look, you've got an on-premises data center. We talked about the legacy, which would be physical, and then the virtualized data center. You might have a managed service provider that's got an element of both. And then you might have a cloud service provider as well. Today, all those things don't necessarily talk to each other in, an, in a very seamless way. But where you really want to get is this coherent network, this network that doesn't perform differently depending on where you are, this network that isn't provisioned differently depending on where you are, is something that works both within all of your data centers and within your public cloud and enables you to have a hybrid cloud. Getting back to that point I made where your applications should sit, should sit where they need to be. Mail and HR apps fit really well in a public cloud. Order management probably fits well in your private cloud. So what are the three steps that you need to go through to get there? The first step you need to do is to simplify your network. You need to secure your network. 
and you need to automate your operations. Let's talk about simplifying your network. So in your old model, You've got a router, you've got a switch, I'm sitting there on CLI, I'm bringing things up, I'm provisioning the server, I'm doing everything on its own. But in the new model, you've got the network where it can do self-provisioning. And part of the way you get to that is you start to simplify it. I talked earlier about the challenge you have in the way we built networks 15 years ago, even, even five years ago. So again, think about that traffic going in north and south, so you're going from an end user up to a server. You don't have server-to-server -server communication. You didn't care how many layers you had, necessarily. You've got your router layer, you've got an edge, you've got an access, you've got aggregation. But then when you look at the way a server-to-server -server has to communicate, it's not performing very well. So the very first thing you want to do is to get into something known as a spine and leaf architecture, where you're taking out one of those layers, where your spine and leaf you're, you're already going to get better performance because one of your layers is gone. But the next thing that's really that, that starts you down this path to getting to the coherent network is you start deploying protocols like something known as multi-chassis link aggregation. So in this scenario, think of your, your access layer. You've got your end users out there. Your spine layer acts as one switch because you're doing a multi-chassis link aggregation. So your your network, the access doesn't care which of those two it goes across. Already you'd then eliminate that need to do manual provisioning. The next thing you can do is start to build what's known as a virtual chassis fabric where your whole network looks like one Ethernet switch. And all of a sudden now you don't have to worry about where are my VLANs, where does this sit, how do I provision this? How does this port talk to the other one? It's all got layer two connectivity to itself and it's managed as one ethernet switch. The next step is to start to deploy an IP open fabric in this scenario. And so your, your network now is all managed as a whole within your own entity. But what this enables you to do is then once you've got this platform set up, now you can do coherence, what we call beyond the edge, and start to exchange data with an Amazon or with a Google and, and relay link state to them or response times and start to choose the best, best paths for your traffic. So this is, this is the simplify the network part. There's a lot of details behind it, but I, you know, this is the conceptual notion of it. And where do you use these different pieces? You know, when should you worry about what? So if you're, if you're in a legacy or private data center and it's not a large data center, you're probably fine with the multi-chassis lag. And that's a standard protocol, standardly used in your common Ethernet switches. You know, I'm not sitting here pitching a proprietary thing we do. Um, then you have the notion of an Ethernet fabric. So that fits in both. As you get into private cloud data centers and larger data centers, and then you get especially into the public cloud, all of a sudden your IP connectivity becomes critical because now you're going over distance, you're connecting your data centers, you're trying to do backups over distance, and you need to have the right foundation that can do that. What's the next challenge that you have? So we, we talked about simplify. Your next challenge is, how do I secure this network? If, if you look at all the elements and how it's built, it can be really tough to figure out well, where does that firewall go? Or where, where do I need to worry about security? Well, the answer is, unfortunately, you need to worry about a, a lot of it. I know this is a crowd in particular that's very focused on it. If you look, if you go back a few years, there's a what we call the castle model. So think of a castle, and it's got a moat around it. And you inherently assume everything inside the castle is safe. And there are no threats inside the castle. And if enemies come, you lift up the drawbridge, you put some alligators in the moat, and there you go. What we have to think about today, though, is there's threats from everywhere. There's even threats from non-human entities that are just coming through bots and, and um, programs that clone themselves. And so think about it like the hotel model. So I think about this hotel here. So it's, it's your room now has a room key because you can't assume the halls are safe. So that's, that's one element of it. But the other element, and Oliver, thanks for giving me this idea in your presentation earlier today, but the other element is I have specific points where I enforce security, but I also have an overall threat intelligence that I coordinate. So, you know, imagine if there were a threat entering the hotel, 
there's a security room in this hotel that has security cameras everywhere. And they can see, okay, there's a problem here, or there's a problem here, or there's a problem here. They're not just relying on you to have an access key to your room for your safety. They're looking at the whole hotel, and they're correlating threats of, around the whole hotel. It's much like that in networking. So where does all that fit? So this is a breakdown of the same thing I've been showing you. So this is that data center topology. You've got an act, well, you've got the spine and the leaf and the router. So a typical firewall in the castle mode would sit in this box one. And this is still critical. It's a stateful firewall. It keeps things from out, you know, bad things outside from coming in. But you have a lot of other places that you need to do enforcement along the way. You've got now virtualized servers running on a physical server. Well, what if one of your virtualized server, and it never exits the server, it goes and threatens another virtualized server, and it's hacking in that way. So you need the ability to have virtual firewalling between your virtual machines and your server. You may also have a need to do um, filters or access control lists, and that can take a lot of load off of this main firewall, like the firewall number one. And what really helps all this work is if you have a... A, an or my clicker is not working. If you have an orchestrated central policy engine, so think of that as the hotel security staff sitting in their room, watching for where the threats are, and enforcing security where it makes the most sense. You've got your room key at your door. You may have doors that lock after hours at night. So it's not relying on just one layer of security. It's relying on multiple layers of security, and it gives you the threat intelligence that you need so you can um, so you can fend off unwanted attacks. So the, we've talked about simplify and secure. So the final thing is, let's, let's say you've got all that in place. Now what's left for you to do is to automate your operations so that you can get to this nirvana of the end user being able to provision or even yourself provisioning things very quickly within seconds. What goes into play? So again, we, I, I like talking a lot about where were we and where do we, where we want to go. In fact, I'll, I'll tell a quick little story. When I was really um, early in my career at Shell, and it was a really new IT department, you know, things were kind of new back then, and sometimes things didn't work that well. We were doing source route bridging, and we had some loops in the network, and I get called up to the CIO and to, pres to talk about why was the network down. And my model was, where were we? You know, where have we been, where we are now, and where are we going? So I, th I think learning all those lessons of how to get out of hot water back in my 20s helps me design my presentation. So I like to go about where were we, and now where do we want to go? So in the old model, you're managing your network devices um, using a CLI uh, or something pretty brute force rather than automating. But what we want to do is get to the point where we have an automation stack and we can orchestrate from there. Now, I'm a hardware engineer, so I'm not a programmer, and I'm learning all this probably along with a lot of folks um, in the room. But um, if you look at the stack, this is, this is where we used to be. We would have our chassis. You'd be running some kind of a proprietary operating system on this. In this case, in our case, it's Junos. Other router vendors have their own operating systems. However, we're starting to get to a world where we've got your XML, so now I can start to run pretty primitive scripts, but I can start to program it. And so instead of programming interface by interface, now I can write a script for this one device. Oh, and now there's other things that are improving all the protocols and, and adding more ease of use. So you've got NetConf, you've got um, Python, Ruby, the, you know, it just goes on and on, the buzzword of the day that you can have. But these are all very important. They're all very useful. Um, my whole SE team is going through class to learn about them. You've got Ansible. So now you've got a lot more uh, richness in your scripting language. Puppet and Chef, uh, those things pr are providing, you know, they're, they're amazingly simple to use, even for someone who isn't a software developer. And you can look at that and say, here's what I want to do. And then tools like Puppet and Chef enable you to very easily script and automate your network. So they're very valuable. And, and those are all, again, those are not something our company makes. That's something widely available in the market and uh, something many, many companies use. So that just gets to one box, though. Now what do I do when I've got a whole network? So, And each of those boxes is running that whole thing. 
So you've got a couple ways you can approach the problem of your network coherence and your automation. You can look at a network management system such as ours, or there's a lot of third-party systems that you can use. We talked about some of them, Chef, Puppet, Python. Um, the, the world is really becoming a much more open world these days, and it's important to understand where to leverage these different technologies. That bottoms-up approach is, is a, for the, I call them the do-it-yourselfers. They may either write their own scripts or they may use some things off the shelf. There's also a wealth of, of tools now for the folks that want to buy more integrated solutions. And I've just thrown up several examples here. There's things from VMware, IBM, HP. There's OpenStack solutions that are in open source and, you know, freeware that you can use. Or you can even build your own. But, what is happening that in here that's the missing link? So network virtualization. Let me describe this in a fairly simple example. You can't get where you need to be unless you can get to a virtualized network, um, also known as SDN or also known as overlays and underlays, whatever terminology you're used to using. What does that exactly mean? So let's let's go back to my simple example and. We used to think we had some element of network virtualization with VLANs. So that's virtual local area networks. So I've got the green network. And I set up a VLAN. And on the exact same um, infrastructure, I set up a red network. That's great. I was already there. Why do I need an SDN or anything else? I can already do that. Well, actually, here's your problem. Let's say your A1 service needs to migrate to a different port for whatever reason. You're reprovisioning the server. You're bringing in new capacity. Uh-oh. Your VLAN didn't move with it, did it? No. Now you've got to go in and manually reconfigure that VLAN to get that to now provide connectivity to it. So there goes your automation and your orchestration. That was the weak link in your chain. Where do we want to go next? So this is, and I'm going to say the promise of overlays, because SDN is still a relatively new technology. It's, it's picking up very, very quickly, though. And so um, here's, here's the promise of it, and we're already seeing it come to bear. So same example. I've got my green network, and now I have my red network. And by the way, I'm using a centralized controller to provision that. Now the centralized controller can understand when that server instance has to move to a new port. And now the centralized controller that is automated is able to reprovision that on the fly. So I no longer have to go do manual intervention for it. And what I get from that is not only the ease of use for the automation, but now see what happens. So let's, let's look at this in a logical fashion. Here's my red network and my green network. What if those two want to talk to each other? Now what do I do? So now I can do what's called service chaining because I don't want them, I don't want finance just talking to HR because there's some serious data breaches that might happen either way. So now I can have virtualized firewalls, virtualized intrusion protection. I can have load balancing, network address translation. And those also exist on virtual machines inside my data center. And so I can have the overlay controller now say, oh, I want a load balancer and a firewall between the red and green network. And just from my console or even just setting up a template of a policy, I now can have that automatically provisioned. And by the way, this is what large Carriers like a Verizon, AT&T, a Bell South, sorry, that's my age again. <laughs> like, you know, like BT, that's what they're doing as well as they're provisioning your home services. So, you know, we're all going to benefit from the automation that is already in existence, but even, you know, being developed and simplified in a very, in a very quick way. So, so that's really the path to the cloud. These are the parts of the cloud. We talked about how to simplify your architecture. We talked about different ways to secure it and why it's important and how overall threat intelligence is important. And then we talked about all the, the pieces that go into automating it and, and why that helps you provide the fast provisioning for your end users and makes your whole department run much more efficiently and your network work much better. So, oh, and I finished early because that was my last slide. So, so I'll give you guys 10 minutes back for your break unless there's any questions.